I'm, uh, I'm Alex Jones, director of the Shorenstein Center uh, on the Press Politics and Public Policy, and I want to welcome you to this discussion, this very timely discussion, certainly, on China and uh, what is happening, what is going to happen, and such. Earlier this month, we were all witnesses to what may prove to be a very important moment for this country and for China. We watched as the world's reigning and what many consider the world's next superpower took each other's measure. But the plane incident was essentially accidental. The events of this week were not accidental. Earlier this week, George W. Bush authorized new arms sales to Taiwan. While the most sophisticated weapons were not included, China responded with outrage. Then yesterday, in what was described by his staff as very carefully crafted language, President George W. Bush appeared to commit the United States to war with China if Taiwan were to be attacked. <clears throat> From the perspective of some experts, this is a significant step beyond the more ambiguous commitment to Taiwan that has been American policy for a long, long time. What is the meaning of all this? What does it portend? Tonight, we shall probe those and other questions about relations between China and the United States, a relationship that without question is vastly important and perhaps defining both strategically and economically. Each member of our distinguished panel has been asked to speak for five minutes, and I shall introduce each of them in turn. We'll then have a conversation among ourselves, and then we'll open it up for questions. Speaking first, to my immediate left, is Kurt Campbell. He's Senior Vice President and Director of the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, where his specialty is U.S. security policy in the Asia Pacific. Before that, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and a member of the National Security Council staff. He was also an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Kennedy School and Assistant Director of the Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. He's currently working on a new book, The Power of Balance, on his experiences in Asia. Kirk Campbell. Thanks very much. It's really nice to be back here at the Kennedy <coughs> School and particularly in the forum. I had a lot of good experiences here in the past. I'll try to go very quickly and just, uh, just underscore three points if I can. The first is uh, the president is just coming to the end of the first 100 days. And I think, as you all know, uh, sort of enshrined in, a par in American m political mythology is what you accomplish in the first 100 days. What's interesting is how much of his time and the time of his team has been focused on Asia policy much more than anyone had anticipated. There was an opening desire by the key members of the foreign policy establishment around him to turn the focus a little bit from China and more towards Japan. The idea of a traditional ally was the bedrock of American commitment in Asia, and then with that secure, re-engage on China. Um, the reality, of course, is that a series of accidents, as we've already heard, and developments which are accidental but could easily have been foreseen, um, we find ourselves in a situation where Asia policy is at its most delicate phase in perhaps the last 20 years. The submarine incident in which a one in a million submarine shot comes up underneath a boat that was launched from the pristine village ideal of Japan, sending that country into a kind of shock, was completely accidental. I'm afraid the EP-3 flight, which was intercepted aggressively by the Chinese fighter plane, could have, been, could have been foreseen. For years, U.S. reconnaissance flights are flying closer and closer to China on a more regular basis. I think Chinese friends look at that and see that not as an expression of a major power flying in international airspace, but a country that is testing it, probing it as it emerges on the international scene. A second issue that I think is important to keep in mind amongst, amidst all these uh, developments on the military side is that it, it, uh, these incidents happen at a very delicate time politically in both China and the United States. My colleagues to the left uh, are much better able to discuss developments in China. Clearly, leadership transitions, a situation in which the uh, urban intelligentsia along the group that we've sought to cultivate is increasingly anti-American. Uh, almost uh, uh, you know, a contradiction in their desire for greater international engagement, but the, at the same time more nationalistic and much more worried about the United States role uh, in the world. You hear more and more concerns in chat rooms and elsewhere about American hegemony. 
but it's in the American political context which I think the most interesting developments, not as much discussed, are occurring. We often think of foreign policy issue debated and divided between the Democrats and the Republicans. What's interesting, particularly about China policy, more than any other foreign policy issue of the last 50 years, is that it makes for very strange bedfellows. And in fact, the divisions on China policy are not so much between Democrats and Republicans, but inside the parties themselves, and particularly within the Republican Party. There is one wing of the party, think of it as your father's Oldsmobile, who believes that China is the next great market, and if we could just sell them some shirts or computers or whatever, we could all do very well. And there's a very power, powerful commercial core in the Republican Party. There's also a group that I think is more powerfully represented in this administration than in Bush one that believes that China is not the great, next great market, but the next great enemy of the United States. And I'm afraid that some of the campaign rhetoric, like previous campaign rhetoric, of President Clinton has animated Asian fears and particularly Chinese fears about a country that sees China as an emerging threat. And I'm afraid the most recent developments, if anything, tend to underscore these concerns. The last point is on Taiwan policy, just very quickly. You're going to be hearing over the next several days um, uh, political uh, recitations of seemingly obscure language uh, that is meant to communicate complex meanings uh, about political uh, desires and uh, uh, instincts. The reality is that if you look beyond the language, the issues that are being struggled over between Washington, Taipei, and Beijing are the classic issues of personality, of power, of influence. What's interesting about what's happened in Washington over the last 24 hours is that President Bush has gone out, as we've heard, with a very powerful statement, a statement I believe everyone acknowledges and understands privately was unplanned and something which they quickly tried to put a fix on. One of our most uh, reliable polit political quipsters in Washington this morning suggested that President Bush is indeed like President Reagan. Um, they both like complex issues um, basically compressed to a one-page memo. The difference between President Reagan and President Bush was that President Reagan read that one-page memo. <laughs> um, um, I think what we have seen, however, is that a, a president or a, 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 a candidate that campaigned on the dangers of ambiguity managed yesterday to make the situation much more ambiguous than it was even before. So I would just suggest to you all that this is not the end of these various issues between the United States and China. Indeed, if anything, it is just the beginning. And I would suggest to you that unlike the relationship between the United States and China, excuse me, the United States and the Soviet Union, which was difficult, the emerging relationship between the United States and China will be much more complex because it will involve areas of cooperation and of competition, and it's going to last not just a couple of years, but probably tens of decades. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Yang Deng. He is an assistant professor of political science at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and was editor of recent special issues of the Journal of Contemporary China entitled China Debates Its International Future. His books include In the Eyes of the Dragon, China Views the World, and he has a forthcoming article entitled Hegemon on the Offensive, China Perspectives on U.S. Global Strategy After the Cold War. Yang Deng. Thanks. Uh, indeed, the U.S.-China relationship is very complex. It is very par paradoxical. You look at the economic and the uh, social levels, Yasin and other panelists can talk about, basically it looks fine, but look at the strategic and security aspect, it, it is, I think, really horrible. Uh, I think it's a great mistake, and I think this kind of good economic social ties sometimes give us a, a, sen a false wishful thinking and the false hope that you know everything will be fine, everything is fine, and I think the recent China incident is a powerful reminder that strategic security issue is very well entrenched and hard to to tackle. Let me outline uh, this security strategic conflict between the United States and China uh, by looking at bilateral and regional and global level. Bilateral level, 
uh, we know the list of problems with you, with, between the United States and China. It goes on and on, it keeps piling up. No solution, no solution to any problem has been found. It just keeps piling up and up. And um, also you look at the great power relationship. Amongst all the static relationship between these great powers, US, Japan, European power, Germany, United States and China, conflicts over strategic, economic, and political issues. It's the most conflictual relationship amongst all the static great power relationship. At the regional level, much, have been said, much has been said about US-China shared interest in the regional peace and security. But these two countries have profound difference in the definition of what peace and security means and what the means to bring about that peace and security in East Asia. For the United States, peace and security rests on US hegemony, US control. And I don't think there, is, ha, there has been a formula uh, that has been worked out to find a kind of uh, cohabitation arrangement between the United States and China and the regional uh, security structure. And in terms of the means of achieving regional security and peace in East Asia, for the United States, essentially three elements. One is theater missile defense. Second, re reinforced security allies with Japan and, and, and South Korea. And the last one is forward troop deployment, military presence. And even if China pursue a conservative, supposed to conservative foreign policy agenda in East Asia, that is to, to China does not pursue an expensive, expansive foreign policy agenda beyond its current territorial claims on Taiwan and South China Sea. That's supposedly, that's supposedly a conservative foreign policy agenda would still put China's interest at odds with the United States. And finally, at the global level, after the Cold War, I think the like-minded, industrialized, advanced democracies have collapsed into a great power group and have categorized themselves as a dominant in-group. Well, in a sense, casting Russia and China as the out-group. For a moment in the mid-1990s, the Chinese political elites actually believed that they could be admitted into the dominant great power group if they behave responsibly thus they identified themselves as a responsible, cooperative, great power. But by the 1990s, I think the political elites basically have re realized that the dominant great power will never admit China into the dominant group on terms acceptable to them. Now, thus, China has quietly, but in a very determined fashion, to step up efforts to bring about a more pluralistic, and more multipolar world, and that they believe is only world order that can advance China's international status. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Merrill Goldman is a professor of history at Boston University, and a research associate and member of the executive committee of the John K. Fairbanks Center for East Asian Studies at Harvard. Professor Goldman is author of a number of books on modern Chinese history and culture, including China's Intellectuals, Advise and Dissent, and Sowing the Seeds of Democracy in China. Her current research is focused on a book entitled From Comrade to Citizen in the People's Republic of China, The Struggle for Political Rights in Post-Mao China. Meryl Goldman. Thank you. I guess I have a, a slightly different take on all this. Um, I, I would agree with Kurt that the relationship between China and the United States is going to be difficult. We're going to have moments of tension, as we've just seen. But I don't see this as another Cold War. It's going to be difficult, but it's not another Cold War. And the reason I say that is, first of all, I must say I was surprised at how easily, not easily, that's the wrong word, but how quickly we got our errant people back, that there was compromise on both sides. We compromised in the way we expressed how we were sorry. They compromised, the Chinese compromised, and not getting the full apology they wanted, and the air people came back. 
Um, even on the issue of Taiwan, I, I feel that there is a, they're, they're not getting, Taiwan is not getting the Aegis uh, system, which of course would have infuriated China. So that I, I, I tend to see that our future relationship is going to be tense, it's going to be complicated, but I don't see this necessarily as, a, as, a, as another Cold War. And the reason I say that is because there are so many other factors bringing us together. The economic factors, no matter what you say about them, 120 billion a dollar trade between China and the United States is, is a huge trade. Um, even though we have a negative balance at this point, we see great opportunities. Uh, China's desire to get into the World Trade Organization, uh, China's desire to have the Olympics in the year 2008. All of these forces, I think, are going to moderate China's uh, policy. And again, uh, getting back to our, our present president, um, he did come out with some very strong statements, but I feel those were statements of inexperience. They were quickly modified. And, and so I think on our part as well, there is that moderation. What I'm concerned about is really having to deal with the domestic scene, the internal scene. And what's going on now is something I, I must tell you, after all these years of studying China, I cannot understand. The, in just recent months, just coinciding with this recent tension, China has been arresting scholars of Chinese origin who have studied in the United States. Several of them are American citizens or have green cards. And there is no explanation. They've been arrested because they say they were spies, at least about two of them. There's no evidence. There's no law case. There's no procedure, nothing. There, is been a, there has been a crackdown on, uh, certainly you, many of you know about the Falun Gong, this Buddhist meditation group, on a large scale. Yet they were able to demonstrate very briefly in Tiananmen Square, but certainly the crackdown is really, really beginning to show. Inside China today, there are several, I guess you'd call them cyberspace or, or uh, computer people, who are opening up the internet to discussion of politics and political reform. Several of these people have been arrested just recently. Now, Elizabeth Rosenthal did a great job the other day describing one of them, but she's a, he's only one of several that have been arrested. So that domestically, there has been this clampdown. And my view of that is that the government the, or these particular leaders are flailing around. They have a sense of insecurity. They have a sense of fear that their leadership might not last long. There is, there is this kind of weakness. Even though it's a strong government, there's weakness in this political structure. And, and I think this clampdown is a reflection of this weakness. And, it seems to me that a government of, at this point, a few old men, I'm sorry to say that, but it's true, um, uh, in a society that is changing rapidly economically and socially with a political, a weak Leninist political system that is no longer in line with what's going on in society, I feel that is the biggest problem ahead. And that is the real problem. And it seems to me what happens in this domestic political scene will be in large part determined China's relations with the United States and also China's relations with Taiwan. Because if China begins to change politically, then that makes it very different in terms of its relations with the outside world. Thank you very much, Bill. <laughs> Yesheng Yang is um, an associate professor at the Harvard Business School in the area of business, government, and international economy. Professor Wang is a faculty associate at the Center for International Affairs at the Fairbank Center at Harvard and a fellow at the Center for Chinese Economic Research at Tsinghua University and the Institute of International Relations at Peking University. He is currently working on a book entitled Selling China, the Institutional Foundation of Foreign Direct Investment in China, which traces the institutional roots of China's high demand for foreign investment. Yesheng Wang. Is it Yang? Uh, Huang, yeah. Huang. But I, I accept the uh, <laughs> alternative uh, ways. Uh, um, I was asked to comment on the economic aspects of the relations between China and the United States. But let me just give three very brief comments on the political aspect, very brief. First, I think that the US coverage of the plane incident was very poor. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was atrocious. Uh, but we can. Uh, deal with the specifics uh, later on. Secondly, I think increasingly 
what has happened is that the relationships between China and the United States are increasingly out of the control of top politicians and top foreign policy establishments in both countries. And this is a problem, I think, because uh, you would expect that the, the elites probably have, um, not necessarily a better idea, but probably have a long-term view about the strategic benefits and cause of that relationship more than, more than, more than other people who are less, either less informed about the relationship or have a less stake in the sustainability of the relationship, and I worry about that. Third, I worry about the fact that under the current Bush administration, increasingly the relationship is taking on a security dimension at the expense, by definition, at the expense at the economic uh, uh, dimension. I worry about that in part because security issues are very, very difficult to handle, more difficult to handle than the economic issues, in part because in economic disputes, I think people from both sides can work out a solution that both sides can walk away feeling happy about. Whereas the security disputes are more intrinsically difficult to handle in that manner. One side necessarily feels that uh, it has been cheated out of the deal, uh, and then the other side would uh, feel uh, happy about the deal. So, so the economic, in the economic disputes, we, we have positive sum solutions. In the security dis disputes, we have zero sum disputes. And the other reason why I worry about the security dimension is Kurt Campbell being a prominent example. The military on the both sides are some of the most unreasonable people that you can uh, ever know. Uh, so more unreasonable than the economic people, and therefore more difficult <laughs> to work out. <laughs> Uh, solution. So on that note, let me comment briefly on the economic uh, aspects of things. Moro mentioned that the fact that this country does have a, a big trade imbalance uh, with China. And let me draw an implication from that. Uh, the, the implication, not, not from Moro, but from many people, is that uh, China now is behaving in its economic uh, behavior similar to Japan, uh, what Japan was doing for many, many years. That's actually just absolutely not true. Uh, there, are three, there, there are two large differences. One is that the trade relationship and economic relationship between China and the United States doesn't have the solid political foundation that Japan and US did. And that makes a big difference. That makes a huge difference. And the strategy here is to have some economic foundation, hopefully to build up the political ties, rather than the other way around. Usually, the usual approach is you have a political foundation and you work out the economic solutions and economic disputes. So that just reinforces the point that it is so much harder to get the relationship on track between the two countries, essentially because the two countries are trying something that has never been tried before, which is to work from economics to politics rather than the other way around. The second difference uh, has to do with the economic uh, differences. Yes, China does have a large trade surplus with the United States, but if we look at how that trade surplus has been generated, the differences between Japan and China are incredibly sharp. One, one reason why China has a large trade surplus with the United States is because American companies are investing in China. Uh, so, the, so the FDI inflow into China is gigantic, uh, is, is, is huge. Japan had no, none of that, uh, none of the FB, uh, FDI. And so if FDI is generating a lot of the, these exports, then the shareholders of the American corporations, which have invested in, in China, reap the benefits of the trade surplus. So, so this idea that somehow China has a large trade surplus and therefore it necessarily hurts the United States, is just simply wrong from, from sort of if we can, if people care about economic analysis, I think that that's one area people should care about. And the other, uh, and, and, and the other uh, dimension of it, which is similar to Japan, but, but it would have different uh, implications. The other dimension is that you want to ask where, uh, uh, where the dollars go in China. China gets a lot of dollars, and, and, and they don't use the dollars to buy US goods. Well, then they use the dollars to invest in America. Uh, they, specifically, they use the dollars to invest in the US Treasury bond. So the U.S. can finance its uh, defense program very, very cheaply. Hopefully, uh, some of these uh, weapons will be aimed at uh, China. So, so who, is get, 
I'm not sure who is getting the worst deal uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in this uh, picture. The third reason why there's a large trade imbalance between China and the United States is essentially because uh, Taiwanese and Hong Kong uh, merchants and businesses, uh, Southeast Asian businesses, are investing in China to produce these goods to be exported to the United States. Otherwise, they would have pro produced the same goods. Otherwise, they would have exported the same goods to the United States. So the United States wouldn't have a large trade deficit with China, but it would have a large trade deficit with those countries. So either way, the United States is going to have a large trade deficit. And then the issue is, why do we care so much about where that deficit comes from? And, and you know, I can, I can understand some conservatives would say that we need to give the uh, trade surplus to Indonesia, to Taiwan, and to other countries rather than to China. But fundamentally, that's driven by, by economics. It's not driven by, by politics. And in the long run, and this is my last comment, in the long run, this kind of trade investment integration, not just between China and the United States, but between China on the one hand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Southeast Asia on the other, in the long run, this kind of trade and FDI integration is extremely beneficial politically uh, in terms of uh, uh, producing peace uh, and stability in the region. So do you want to deny the access uh, of uh, China to the U.S. market uh, because somehow you have this notion that uh, China deserves to be punished. But the result of that is to, uh, is to harm this kind of uh, very politically extremely beneficial trade relationship among Asian countries. I would think that's uh, not a good strategy. Thank you. Professor Wong, thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, Tony Seish is the Daiwu Professor of International Affairs, Director and Faculty Chair of the Asia Programs at the Center for Business and Government, and Director and Faculty Chair of the China Public Policy Program, all at the Kennedy School. He's very busy, in other words. <laughs> From 1994 to 1999, he was representative for the China Office of the Ford Foundation, and before that, was Director of the Sinological Institute at the Leiden University in the Netherlands. He's recently completed a book entitled Governance and Politics of China, which will be coming out at the end of this year. Tony Seish. Thank you. Um, well, being last, obviously, a lot has been said. So I think I'd like to pick up on, on three issues. The first one relating to the question that uh, Ya Sheng raised about the constraints on the elite and the leadership, and talk a little bit about what I think uh, the process of negotiation around the plane in Hainan reveals or confirms about decision-making in China. Secondly, why China uh, seemed to take a set of options which from the US and European perspective uh, looked to do itself a disservice and a disfavor. And then thirdly, linked to one of the comments that Merle made about uh, the questions of domestic reform in China. So first of all, what, what did this process reveal about what we know about decision-making? in China. I think first of all, it showed us that essentially China works under a process of consensus politics. It's very difficult for it to deal quickly and rapidly with this kind of crisis situation. There's been ideas floated of some kind of national security council in China, but there's no really good convening mechanism to bring together all the necessary powers to bring a quick resolution on strategy. So the kind of issue festered for a day or two before people could begin uh, to get to grips uh, with the issue. I think secondly, for Jiang Zemin himself, this is a very difficult issue to deal with. Uh, remember, he's going to have to retire as the head of the party next year. He's going to have to step down as state president the year after. Whatever attempts he's made to stay on seem to have been rebuffed. The one post he's probably going to be able to keep is the head of the Military Affairs Commission. So that makes it very difficult for him to do something that would irritate or alienate the military. Now, obviously, the military in China is, is not a monolithic or uniform organization. There's many different views in it. But particularly with this situation and the sensibilities, it would be very difficult for him to move ahead very quickly on a resolution without taking into account uh, PLA concerns because he wants to be able to head that commission uh, after his retirement from other places. Remember, there's no PLA member on the Standing Committee of the Politburo, which is quite a significant change. 
That might mean the PLA is being more marginalized in civilian politics, or it might feel that they trust uh, Jiang Zemin to carry out their behest. I think thirdly, what I think it shows is, it confirms that we're seeing a professionalization taking place with the PLA in China. It doesn't want to get involved in every single issue in China. But what it has laid out is that there are certain areas which are crucial to the PLA's interest. And on those areas, it voice wants to be heard, and it has to be central. And of course, the relationship with the US and the question of Taiwan are the core of those interests. So it's impossible for Jiang to make initiatives without having the PLA on board with that. Fourthly, the last thing related to this is, um, it was a very difficult situation to handle with, in terms of nationalist sentiment within China. That made a quick resolution difficult. Now this is a, is a very dangerous, the proverbial uh, double-edged sword for China uh, to deal with, or China's elite to deal with. On the one hand, with declining legitimacy in a number of other areas, but economic growth uh, as a factor binding people together, China has often pushed uh, nationalist sentiment. At the same time, of course, it knows because it needs the US for its development objectives, the kind of some of the issues that Yao Sheng has been talking around with FDI, it can't push that so far uh, that street demonstrations or protests begin to uh, undermine its credibility internationally. But at the same time, it can't appear too weak because then it, it feels vulnerable uh, to the kinds of pressures that could be picked up uh, within uh, different groups in the elite from citizen uh, dissatisfaction and unrest. So I think these are some of the factors that made it very difficult from China's perspective to make a, a quick resolution on this. And so we finished up with a situation getting very bad press in the US where the hostages uh, were being held or the US pilots and crew were being held effectively as hostages for much longer than many would have thought. Personally, I think if China had let them go immediately and kept the plane, which is quite a different issue, I think they would have won in the world of court opinion and would have had a lot of bargaining chips. So for some of these reasons, they couldn't make that quick resolution. Now, what do they want to get out of it? I think essentially you look at a new administration coming in under President Bush, and what does it look like as an administration? Well, we heard Mr. Campbell's comments about the quip uh, in uh, Washington uh, just uh, recently about President Bush's recent comments, but it looks like a regime that doesn't consider China seriously. It doesn't think China is a serious player in the international stage. It doesn't think hardly anybody else is either, but that's a different point. It thinks that basically on missile defense, issues that are of key concern to the US, it does not have to engage these countries in a process of negotiation. It doesn't really have to take China seriously. China's views do not matter. It has defined China differently, potentially as a strategic competitor rather than a strategic partner. Now, if you were sitting in Beijing, I think this would sound quite worrying and quite threatening. And there you have this incident occurring. I think this was a great opportunity for the Beijing leadership to make it very, very clear to Washington, you talk to us, you negotiate with us, we are serious, you cannot trample on our concerns, rightly or wrongly, whatever we might think of that as a standpoint. This was a great opportunity to make very clear from Beijing's perspective to Washington, you treat us seriously and you talk with us or you do not get what you want. Coming on to the last point, um, it's been stressed the networks are deep, uh, multifaceted, so it's going to be a very complex relationship. Uh, Bush's recent comments, of course, were not uh, particularly helpful. Even if I was from Taiwan, I think I would have been a little disturbed uh, by those uh, uh, comments before his spin uh, doctors got to work on that. But I think, is there a silver lining in this? I think potentially yes. I also agree with Merle that the real challenges for China are domestic. They're not international. I do believe the Chinese leadership, when they talk about wanting a peaceful international environment, they need it. They need U.S. involvement. They need U.S. Uh, development, uh, investment rather, for their own development objectives. They can do it, but it'll be much, much harder without those objectives. One of the problems is they're using old methods to deal with the new environment. I think this goes back to Mel's, Mel's comments about how Falun Gong, other groups have been dealt with. It must be baffling to them. You know, the kinds of mobilization campaigns, the traditional Maoist ways of dealing uh, with dissent aren't working anymore. That must be very disturbing to a leadership confronting these very deep domestic challenges that are facing it. So I think there's an incentive from China's side to make this relationship work. 
over the longer term. So in the sense of, of a silver lining, I think out of President Bush's comments yesterday, and the very quick way people have had to back off for him, clearly shows there's limits to how far this policy can be shifted. I think the plane incident has made Washington realize we have to talk to China. It's probably made China realize, okay, we're dealing with a different uh, administration, but essentially we've got to take this relation seriously. It has to be worked at and it has to be uh, thought through more coherently. So if, if something positive has come out of this, that is what I would say it is. Tony Sage, thank you. Let me, uh, the, the Shorenstein Center's focus is media, and I would like to begin by, by asking Professor Wong to be a little more expansive about his critique of the American media's coverage. But let me ask you one thing in particular, because it seems to me that uh, perhaps another silver lining, uh, this has focused a great deal of attention on China in this country in the last two weeks. Now, perhaps they've gotten some erroneous impressions. One of the most disturbing pieces of information that I got from the media coverage was the idea that as China seems to be evolving into a place of more openness and more freedom, uh, that this is not necessarily going to lead to any kind of a, uh, uh, of a, of a relaxation with the United States. In fact, it could lead to a kind of much more strident and uncontrolled nationalism that could, in fact, make it much more difficult to deal with, uh, with China. Uh, in the future, but I'd like to get your own views. I usually don't watch TV, but I watch a lot of TV during this um, the, this uh, episode. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was uh, extremely uh, uh, shocked to see on, on TV was um, a total lack of uh, uh, challenge to irresponsible remarks. Uh, uh, from uh, r mostly right-wing Republicans uh, and uh, not so much from left-wing Democrats, um, whom you know a lot of their criticisms of China I can go with. But the right-wing Republicans, I, I I I think that they need to be challenged by the TV anchor persons. Let me just give a few examples, uh, and we're talking about respectable TV shows. We are not talking about uh, uh, the ones. <laughs> Uh, that the are not respectable. The network was very, very different in its coverage of this than the other networks. Yeah, the, well, the PBS, let me, let me start with PBS. Uh, <laughs> that's that's uh, respectable. Uh, on one of the programs, one of the uh, senators said, after the crew was released, uh, he said, this is Nazi Germany. Well, I don't know, I mean, if he was making light of Nazi Germany or he was uh, criticizing China too much. It's okay for him to say that. You know, Nazi Germany killed six million Jews and, and China released uh, 11 crew members, uh, uh, 24 crew members in 11 days. For me, I don't see the, I, I mean, maybe there's a way of sort of <laughs> equating the two things, but I, I don't see it uh, and I need to be convinced on that. And, and the, what's, what's incredible is that nobody challenged him on it was, that it was said in the context yeah. of a, it wasn't a sound bite, it was in the context no, of the No, no, the person was being interviewed mm -hmm. and he was going on and on about this. And the other person uh, uh, said, um, oh, this is just like uh, 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 countries like Iran, Korea, uh, North Korea, and Iraq. Iran, a country that uh, kidnapped uh, the American embassy uh, officials for some 200 days at the gunpoint. This is after the coup were, re were released. Again, no, no, not a single word of challenge from the, from, the, from the anchor person. You know, in academic seminar, if a person says something like this, people will say, oh, could you defend your proposition? I mean, at least I think that's, that's the kind of the normal uh, response that people should, should have. Uh, Korea, North Korea, the, the country that captured uh, the U.S. Uh, ship uh, on high sea and, and put them uh, through uh, show trials. And, and what's the comparison? What's the com not a single word of challenge from from these uh, from these journalists. Talking about the print journalists, you mentioned the uh, nationalism. I think this is one of the problems. One of the problems is that if you read the uh, mainstream newspapers, the impression, the overwhelming impression you get is that. Chinese government inflamed nationalism, when in fact my understanding is that the Chinese government in this particular episode tried to contain nationalism as much as they could and they couldn't quite do it. 
one of the reasons why the Chinese are nationalistic today is precisely because there is a view in China, we can debate about that view, there's a view in China that this country has a systematic program of containing China, of stopping Chinese economic growth. Right? We can debate about that proposition, but there is that widespread view. And that view doesn't necessarily lack any empirical foundation. They can name quite a few things to, to back up their claim, which I totally disagree with, but, but I have more information. And I have more faith in this country than, than they do. They point to 1993 when the US Navy stopped a Chinese ship on, on international water, Yinghe, Yinghe ship, stopped the, stopped the ship on international water at the gunpoint, boarded the ship, searched for the chemical weapons, didn't find any, let the ship go. In open violation of, of sovereignty, people remember that. That was only, you don't, you don't need to be Chinese to remember things that happened seven years ago. Because uh, people often talk about, oh, 19th century opium war and stuff like that. No, you don't have to go back there. You go back to seven years. In, in 1993, uh, the Senate uh, uh, passed the resolution opposing the Chinese bid for Olympics. That was very, very hurtful. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Because essentially, you know, we're talking about 1.2 billion fairly poor people wanting an opportunity to develop their economy, to improve their basic living standard. And here it is, the United States trying very, very hard to deny the country of an opportunity to earn some decent living. That really, really hurts. I mean, so the depth of the feeling is totally missing in any reports that I have seen. And, and it's, 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 it's outrageous uh, that I think that the, um, with, with, the, with, the, with the kind of uh, technological capabilities of the media, with, the, with the, a lot of people in China, actually you have a lot of these journalists in China, they fail to report these some basic background issues. And, 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 and therefore, the American uh, public doesn't have the context to understand a lot of these things. Mm. Can I, I just talk to the other Absolutely point real. you made? Um, there were several articles, and again, I'm talking about the respectable press. This is actually in the New York Times, about um, something to the effect that if China were a democratic country, this nationalism would have been much worse because actually in the, this particular government, they clamped down on any feeling of nationalism. And in many ways, China would be France three times over. Well, my view is that's fine. You want to have a France three times over. I, when I speak to my Chinese friends, I said, the best kind of relationship I think you could have with the United States is similar to the relationship we have with France. We have a tense relationship with France, even three times over. We have a tense relationship with France. It's not all sweetness and light. But nonetheless, we know that we're not going to go to war with France. We're not going to get into any kind of a shooting kind of match with France. So my, my view is, uh, um, and this, this was the article actually by someone I expect very much, Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times uh, Review. And, and I, I was upset by that. First of all, he talked about this growing nationalism based in part on the chat rooms on the internet. Well, you know, if you look at our chat rooms on our internet, you, if you wanted to judge our country by those standards, or even, I mean, it would be far worse than anything that even Yashang is talking oh my about. God. <laughs> so he, my he point is, was, he said it was France three times older. I mean, did he choose the wrong country, or was he trying? Did he? I mean, no, I think he's right. I, we, we would like France, but I mean, what over. is that? What it, what? China would be, a nationalistic China would yeah, be. Yeah, but France, he didn't think he didn't happen to think else? that was good. I happen to think that's what we want. Well yeah. I guess my question is, is that what it would be, Kurt? Yes. Well, wanna, but you want a democratic friends. Right? I want a democratic yeah, I'm talking about a okay. democratic country. Yeah. I find myself in 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 almost violent agreement with Professor Wong, so I'm sort of <laughs> struck by that I, I guess I am the play the role of the unreasonable guy on the on the panel but <laughs> as I was driving as, as, as I was driving in uh, and looking at the rowers and I was thinking back on my years at Harvard and thinking well gee academic politics must not have been as bad as I remembered but it's <laughs> still nice to be here um, if, 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 if I could say I think what's interesting is the earlier question about how each cover each country both covered and interpreted the this crisis and I think What's interesting is how two previous incidences in both countries animated for each of their political leadership, how they responded and how they dealt with the, with the situation. 
For the United States, it was clearly um, the uh, Iran hostage crisis, which for a new president, the idea of being compared with Jimmy Carter at a time where the idea, well, no, the idea of the political impotence not being able to maneuver in such a delicate uh, period, I think was very hard on a new team that's still finding its feet. In China, I think we have to look carefully at the immediate response and the sort of the, um, the template that was used, is, it was almost identical to the template that was used uh, after the tragic bombing uh, in, uh, dur during the 1988, 1998 Kosovo campaign. Apology, reparations. They maneuvered off that rather significantly and quickly, but it does suggest that, well, gee, that worked in the past. Let's try this sort of similar approach. I think also one of the ways that the United States and China has dealt with each other in the past, at least in the public realm, is that oftentimes, initially, Chinese friends will take a very tough often difficult position publicly, paint themselves into a corner, actually say, you know, here's a little box, now you help us get out of that box, which is an inordinately difficult thing for um, administrations to do. Now, I would tell you, I was in the Clinton administration, we spent a lot of time helping Chinese friends get out of the box, uh, boxes that they were put in. They put themselves in. This administration doesn't want to do that. They really are not going to play that game, and so there is going to be a very different cultural approach. If I could just disagree with one quick thing that Merle said, I do think it's interesting to suggest that there was a compromise, right? There was a compromise um, that allowed us to sort of get through this process. But the reality is the compromise, compromise broke down almost immediately, right? In which both sides, both sides began to criticize and to uh, suggest you know, how, how each side dealt in bad faith. And the last point I would make, just what's interesting, I think it would be incorrect to suggest that there's a substantially different character between security negotiations and economic negotiations. In fact, I think security negotiations can often end in results that are much better than people um, believe. And I would just take issue. Economic issues and economic negotiations over the last couple of years between the United States and China have been positively poisonous and have, in fact, eroded confidence rather than enlarged confidence. And I think one of the problems has been there's clearly a political problem in the United States in terms of how we conceptualize China. That's a lot of what we're seeing here in this discussion tonight. My sense is, and I've been in a lot of negotiations with Chinese friends, I respect them. I want to come out with uh, conclusions that I think meet our, meet our mutual interests. I've met very few Chinese friends that accept and understand positive sum outcomes. There is a negotiation strategy that, at its core, can be very zero sum. Mm -hmm. Tony Seish, let me ask you a, a slightly different question. When you look at this administration's handling, when you look at its, what, what it apparently had as its first impulse, which was to demand that the plane was returned to send a carrier into the China Sea. Then they backed away from that and set the carrier away. Then yesterday, George Bush, you know, if we assume that he had not genuinely scripted this, but was speaking from his heart effectively, what he came out with was something pugnacious and, uh, and much more sort of uh, uh, aggressive than he then has now backed away from. But what does this say both about the, the sh wisdom and the savvy of this administration in dealing with this issue and what their real uh, attitudes are? Well, I don't think uh, it points to a high degree of sophistication. Um, in fact, if I look at the, the administration since it's come in, it, it really seems to have a very specific notion of the national interest, and that national interest is at the fore, and to a large extent, other countries don't matter. I mean, we've seen Japan offended, we've seen South Korea offended, European Union has been disturbed, there's problems in the Middle East, and now we've seen situations where China is offended. So I haven't seen a, a high degree of sophistication in terms of realizing that even if you want to meet those objectives, you've got to do that in sort of negotiations and often through bilateral and, and multilateral forums. And, as I, as I said before, right or wrong, you know, if I was sitting in Beijing, I, I would feel quite offended by what I'd seen. It's like, we don't count, and, you know, we don't have to talk to you. But, but is this, you don't, do you think this is completely just clumsiness, or is it really calculated? I wonder whether it's clumsiness. I wonder if it's, uh, well, I think there's a distinction between what, it, it's almost like the, 
the administration has taken in its presidential posturing into now being the system. And that might be because, in a sense, this crisis happened too soon in the administration. I don't know about appointments in Washington. I'm not an insider. But it seems to me their foreign policy team is not really up and running and in place. And yet they had to deal with the crisis. And you've got Bush out the front there, presumably with not a lot of backup advising him. Or if they are advising him, maybe he didn't read the memo. I don't know. <laughs> but, but where he's sort of in a front line without a lot of backup that you know, leads him just to sort of say things which are all very well and good. I mean, Clinton talked about the butchers of Beijing, you know, when he wanted to become president. But, you know, we, we, and President Clinton, I don't think, dealt any better, to be quite honest, with the, with the NATO bombing in the first day or two. And I think there, there is a misunderstanding of cultural sensibilities. I think if, the pres if, if Clinton hadn't, for example, appeared looking relaxed in California, without a tie on if Tony Blair hadn't come out in the same way and almost make it seem like, yeah, we're kind of sorry these people died, you know, but let's move on. Culturally, that is very unacceptable in China, and so those signals are missed. But I, I just want to make one other comment related to something that, that Ya Sheng said. And while I agree that the reporting is often not very profound, I think there's also problems with the media on the Chinese side in terms of allowing access. And I've always felt that, you know, China always says it's different. China always says it's special. It, it's not. I mean, it, it has the same development problems as any country in the world. You know, the Chinese characteristics are the problems of dealing with poverty and development. But because they say that, and because they deny access for journalists, there's almost a, you know, a friction and quite a hostile atmosphere builds up between foreign journalists and China. Almost like anything we're going to be told is a lie. And we've got to catch out on that. And I've often believed that if China just allowed journalists to go and look around, see the problems that it confronts, the poverty, the challenges, we'd begin to see China as a normal country. But they you know, to change their political system to do Yeah, that. but, well, you know, well, I mean, there are other authoritarian regimes which allow much more freedom of access to journalists. And I think provide more sympathetic reporting as a result, because you get a much more of a nuance of the challenges that are facing China. And I think part of it is a structural problem. I mean, admittedly, we might all like to see broader uh, political change. But I think you know, that, to a large extent, dominates the picture we get of China. And, it, and it's, a, it's a partial and it's a false picture. But if they allowed foreign journalists to do that, they'd have to allow their own domestic journalists to other do that. Other countries don't necessarily do them. that. I mean, well, other that countries. Be right either. No, it wouldn't be right, but it happens. Did no, you have a comment that you wanted to? Well, I, I, I was going to say the, the other issue is I, I would agree that there are some really irresponsible things said in, in our media. If Americans knew more of what was actually said in the Chinese media about the United <laughs> States, they would be astonished. Because, and this is not something that's just been going on for a couple of years. It's it's really quite blood curdling to the point that we privately, privately on many occasions, have gone and said, "Hey, you've really got to cool this. Mm -hmm. This is not mm -hmm. conducive to building trust and confidence across this uh, across yeah. the divide between." Washington and Beijing. If I could just make one final point on the Bush team that's that's coming in, I, I do feel you got to give these guys a chance. I mean, it is early <laughs> days. I mean, they don't. They, I, I think there are many divisions that are playing out. I, I will tell you, it's hard for me to sit and listen about how they're the pros. Finally, the pros are back, and the <laughs> amateurs have been thrown out. I think the reality is the one thing that united. Republican Party activists on, of all stripes over the last eight to 10 years was opposition to the Democrats and particularly to President Clinton. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when these guys were in power, the Cold War was in full swing. And they have not debated or discussed or really come to terms with the fact of how much the world has changed, not just how quickly the media occurs, but the nature of the challenges. And I think what you're seeing is an attempt by this team to narrow the de definition of security to very narrow military issues. They're trying to say, look, environmental issues, AIDS, things, all that stuff, that's sort of elsewhere. We want to focus on national missile defense and some of these very narrow issues. I'm afraid that that approach is going to head into some significant uh, problems, even with our close allies like Germany, Britain, and Japan. Professor Deng, let me 
ask you about the missile defense issue and how that's going to fit into this mosaic. Uh, let, me, let me just say a few words about the reporting here. I think I'm very worried, uh, concerned about this you know, kind of bias building here. I mean, the sweeping generalization, the misuse uh, of historical analogy you know, of German and Nazi German and all that. Because the danger of that is you've gradually those stereotypes will form into a more coherent kind of uh, image, uh, a schematic of information. When that happens, then no factual information, no matter what kind of you know, historic factual reporting from the, the scholars or journalists can really penetrate, change anything. And that really is a dangerous path we're seeing here. Uh, if those um, misperceptions are not re rebunked, uh, rejected. I don't, and I'm not seeing that. So this, this is a danger here. Um, and the second point I want to make is, you know, with regard to George Bush's new policy, of new linkage with regard to the arms sale to Taiwan. It's a smart policy because that allows the United States to sell the decide arms to Taiwan without being constrained by the August 17 agreement. And that sort of gains the United States the leverage in dealing with China. Well, we can tell the Chinese, OK, if you decrease your threat to Taiwan, behave yourself, then we can reconsider our arms sale package to Taiwan. The linkage policy, I'm reminded of Clinton's uh, 1993 linkage, linkage trade to human rights. And I do see this similarity here. That policy proved to be a failure, and he reversed that a year later, 1994. The reason is because those issues, human rights and Taiwan, go to the heart of its regime survivability. And I'm not sure you can sort of play this game and link in those two. And because if you do that, this relationship is not going to be stable. It's going to be very bumpy. It's going to be tension ridden. Um, now, the final point about uh, uh, the, missile the missile defense. I think that Taiwan and missile defense um, are the most critical security issues for the Chinese because of the simple fact that, yes, in terms of intention, we're not, you know, US national missile defense is not, at least we claim it's not targeted against the Chinese or the Russians, but simply because in terms of the capability, even the most conservative, the first pa package of uh, national business could shoot down 20 incoming missiles. And we all know that China has about 20 intercontinental missiles that could reach the United States uh, continent. So um, from the Chinese perspective, they were the first country and the only country that has been threatened by both superpowers during the Cold War five, six times. And they try very hard to, 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 to build that minimum nuclear deterrent capability. And I don't think this can, this issue, I don't know how this issue can be addressed. It's a really difficult issue. And again, if we, are not, if we say it's not against them, then should we be prepared to allow them to build 300 missiles without being alarmed, without perceiving it as, as, a, as a counterbalancing act from the Chinese? Professor Wong. Um, <clears throat> I think the difference between George Bush, George W. Bush, and President Ronald Reagan and, and President Clinton is actually profound, um, apart from the memo and, and all that. One big difference between, I think, George Bush, George W. Bush, and, uh, and President Ronald Reagan is that Reagan at least had a strategic view about the world. There was a Soviet Union, and he knew that Soviet Union was a bigger enemy to the United States, and he needed China to counterbalance that. So this is, so essentially the world has changed because Soviet Union no longer exists, so that's a big, big difference. And whereas President Bush tends to view China as a enemy or as a competitive, strategic competitor in and of itself, and, and that, that makes a big difference. The difference between President uh, Clinton and President George W. Bush is a intellectual one. Um, <laughs> There, there's a difference in the level, but, but, but let, let me not talk about the level, but there's a difference in the intellectual approaches that they use to analyze China. Clinton, essentially, I thought from day one, he, the way he viewed China was that China was a dynamic place, so it can 
go up, it can go down, it can go this direction, it can go that direction. And the United States had a role of shaping the direction of the development. Right? So, so he linked trade with human rights in a way, in his own way, he thought that was, that was the way to change China in a direction that was beneficial. Whereas President George W. Bush views China as a given, as, as a static entity. It doesn't change. So it is an entity to be contained. It is not entity to be shaped and to be influenced. That's a big difference. That, I mean, that produces very, very different policy implications. And this whole idea about national security interests, I don't really know how you define national security interests in this day and age. But as uh, uh, Mr. Campbell put it, uh, then he was forced to define it in military terms when in reality it is those other things that are much more important now after the Cold, Cold War. So I, I, I mean, I, I want to give President Bush more time, but, but from what, you know, what I have seen and from what I saw with early Clinton years, I, I'm not encouraged. And, 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 and I think this is, a, this is a big problem in the next four years between China and the United States. I'd like to open it to the audience now. So uh, if you would, if you have a question, go to the microphones here and here. And if you would, uh, identify yourself before you speak. We've got one here and one over here. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Alex Berenberg. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'd like to thank you all for coming today. It's been really informative. Uh, my question is, what do you see as the future of democracy in China? Um, democracy. Who would like to leap on that, Merle? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, I, I would like to write a book on that. Um, let me just say <laughs> that. <laughs> you have one. <Well. laughs> I'll try. Um, I, as you can see, I'm a more optimistic person. So I, my view is that as China evolves gradually, I think there is a potential. It's not going to be like Taiwan, and it's not going to be like South Korea. But I do think there's a potential. And what you're seeing, for example, with the village elections at the bottom, I think that's where it's starting. Now, the real problem is, where do you go from the village elections? Does it, do you go up to the township, the county, the province? That hasn't happened. But I think there is pressure from below. China has become a pluralistic society. Uh, it has many, many different interests there. And that is why I say this is a very different society than existed under Mao. And they're going to have to devise a system that will respond to it. And the system that is most appropriate will be a form of democracy. Now, if you tell the Chinese, well, you're going to have a democracy like India, they, they think, you're, you know, they don't want that. That's, that's the worst they can imagine, because that's chaos. They want an orderly democracy. And I, I think the real problem is there's no such thing, really, as an orderly democracy you see here. But um, what we saw in Taiwan is that you had, they started with the bottom in the 50s. And, but it was then from the top, when Zhang Jingguo, Zhang Kai-shek's son, decided to recognize an opposition party, open up the press uh, to a certain degree of freedom. That's when you began to have it. So it was a combination from the bottom and the top. So far, I think you're getting the bottom. You still have to get the top. Thank you very much. Can I just please sure. quick on this yes. very quickly? Yeah. The, uh, you know, in Cambridge, someone, when asked a complex question, they say, well, I'd, I'd like to write a book about it. In Washington, we give you a quip from a taxi driver. But <laughs> um, I was in Shanghai uh, a couple of months ago. Just interesting, because we're. I, driving with someone who's fluent and asked the question, you know, uh, do you think there'll be uh, democracy in China? And the tax driver, absolutely, without any question, democracy is in our future. They said, well, about how long? He said, oh, I don't know, it's too hard to tell. Well, how long is it? A thousand years? Oh, no, it'll take much longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is John Faulkner. I'm a doctoral student at the Harvard Design School. And uh, I did want to say one thing. Um, I lived in China for a couple of years and have read a lot of Chinese media and I'm always struck when Chinese people criticize the US media and I'm, I'm not defending the US media but I'm always struck by the what I perceive as an incredible level of irony especially when they're talking about criticizing our media for being not objective or you know putting forth US self-interest in its positions but anyway that's not what I wanted my question <laughs> is um, I'm interested in the level of nationalism. I, I taught English in China 10 years ago, and I was there during the Tiananmen Square incident. And I taught at a pretty good Chinese university, and most of my students um, 
I would say probably 60 to 70 percent of my students that I got to know were incredibly pro-U.S. Um, of course, there were people who were anti-U.S., but um, I'm struck so much by the change in 10 years. And I wonder, do you see this? I'm interested in the trajectory of this. Is this a, a short-term cyclical thing, or is this something that's deeper? Professor Wong. Well, OK, so I, I'm not no longer in my 20s, but uh, let me try to answer that question. Um, I mean, your, your comment about Chinese media, I absolutely agree with you. I, I give up my hope on Chinese media, so that's why I focus on the US, <laughs> US media. I, uh, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, the, so, so when you criticize US media, you criticize with the hope of improving it. And so, <laughs> about the young people, about the young people, you are absolutely right, the, in the 1980s, uh, you know, that's when I was young. In the 1980s, we were extremely pro-America, extremely pro-West. And a profound change has been this conversion from pro-American uh, pro -American attitude toward uh, anti-American attitude. I think one of the reasons is actually the one I talked about. There were specific events that happened in 1990s that, that made uh, Chinese young people uh, not very happy with the United States. But I think more profoundly, it is because I said I can relate to the left-wing democratic criticisms of, of China because we, uh, people in the 30s and 40s, lived through the Cultural Revolution. We could relate that criticism because we knew that the system was capable of doing lots of bad things. So we could intellectually, I can, even though I, I would argue that China today is totally different from before, but we still know that it is still the, 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 the system that was doing lots of bad things. But imagine a person growing up in 1990s, mm. a young Chinese person growing up in 1990s, without having had any perspective on cultural evolution. You know, that person is not going to understand the US criticisms of China on human rights grounds. He or she lived a good life, a lot of party, a lot of drink, uh, you know, people here you know, in Harvard College do. I mean, it's very difficult for this person to relate to that criticism, right? So, so for, the, for, the, for the people that are you know, 10 years older than, than the current generation, yeah, I mean, they, they don't, you know, they intellectually debate whether it's, it's the productive way of uh, punishing China because of human rights, but they don't deny at the intellectual level that there's a human rights problem. I don't deny. Let me just add one thing, though. I think in the 1980s, there was such an idealization of the United States that there was bound to be a reaction when they found it wasn't quite paved with gold as, as, as they really thought it was. But let me also just say something about this. In that article I mentioned of, of Christoph's, there was a picture. And the young man in the picture, supposedly mouthing all these anti-American things, was wearing a Harvard t-shirt. And I thought, well, here it is. You can spout off these things, but when you really want to go and get an education, you're going to go to the United States. Um, Ezra Volga was just in China and spoke at, be at Beijing University just at the time of this incident. And the students were very positive and very enthusiastic. Um, so about what he had to say. I don't know what he had to say, but obviously, I mean, there was not, he didn't feel this kind of resentment. Well, so maybe, I, maybe it's because of what, what he, he said. said. Yes, it could be. <laughs> but my point is, I still think that despite what Yashang, and I agree with Yashang, but there are still, if you ask them where they want to go to school, what culture they want to catch up with in some ways, they will say the United States. No, but there's a, there's a difference, though, because in the 1980s, uh, Chinese students come into the United States usually with a question, what is it that we can learn from the United States? And then what is, it, what is wrong with China with the, with the kind of system we have? With the students coming from China now, I increasingly don't get that question, increasingly. So, so the people, yes, I may agree with Murray, a lot of young Chinese people want to come to the United States to study, but they treat it as a technical issue. They treat it as a professional, part of their professional development. Whereas for people who came to this country in the 1980s, it was part of their soul. It was, it was looking for a right solution. That's a very, very different attitude. Okay. Yes, over here. My name is Mike Weissman. I work at the Kennedy School. I read in the Post today that a poll taken of Americans indicated that 25% of those polled, 1,000, 1,200, whatever the N was, had a negative view of Chinese Americans, which really surprised me and does not speak well of this of the American populace, in my mind. 
I've also read that there's increasing um, sentiment at the popular level in China against Americans, even if it's um, you know sort of mistakenly taken from Nicholas Kristof looking at web boards. So in this context, I wonder what you think the chances are of any kind of uh, uh, hacktivism, so-called uh, cyber war type things, on the part of more activist kind of groups, either in the States or in China, in either taking the form of just defacing websites or more concerted kinds of things like releasing email viruses or uh, DDoS kinds of attacks like we saw by, about by a year who, ago. By, by whom? Who, who would be doing this? Well, I'm thinking mostly of um, either in the United States or in China, just groups of, of people loosely affiliated who have really strong feelings anti-China or anti-US and want to express that feeling by some kind of cyber activity. You have that cyber expertise. Yeah. If, if, if the question is, you know, what, what are the prospects for some, you know, group of people in the United States, I assume, I'm, I'm not suggesting you're, you're suggesting this, but Sino-Americans or uh, Americans of Asian ancestry, I think that's just ridiculous. And, and I think that the, I, I, I don't think that's what he's No, no, no just, just to be clear, I'm not saying that there's yeah, going to be I some, think, yeah. but if, if groups of Chinese citizens are justifiably, in my mind, aggrieved by the treatment they're getting from the U.S., would there be any response? I, me, I, I, I mean, there, the there seems to be, in, yeah. from what I read, I, I some people you. think this is a concern. I, um, I, it's hard for me to answer the second part of your question, but the first part that you posited, um, of all the things that have worried me in the last two or three weeks, of which we've cataloged a fairly substantial um, uh, collection, um, the Yankelovich poll, uh, which I've actually seen in some detail, is by far and away the most worrisome um, condemnable, horrible um, thing I can imagine. And what I would love to see is a uh, senior moral and political leaders speak out immediately on this, because this is a trend that just cannot go, in, uh, go on in the United States. I, I mean, I... Uh, like George Bush, for instance. Oh, but, but not just George Bush, moral leaders, people who have standing. This is, this is, this is unconscionable. No, no, and I'm not, come on, come on. Uh, we need a broad, a broad group of Americans speaking out against this. We cannot allow ourselves to go down this path. Do you think, let me ask you, do you think this is genuinely a problem here, or do you think it's just a momentary, you know, thing? Because one of the things that struck me was how completely content Americans seem to be to let the Bush administration go from a confrontational one to, to trying to clearly trying to accommodate China without, you know, a big uproar of anti-Chinese sentiment that I discerned. Or, or what do you think? Well, let me just say, I read that poll too, and there was a large percentage that had a positive view of Chinese Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was 50 percent or more, I can't remember. So I, I would suspect, as, as the man who was there from the um, Anti-Defamation League, they used to have those figures just in the early 90s about American Jews. I don't think this is that unusual, uh, Kurt, frankly, about... I, well, I mean, if I, yeah. I, I've actually seen the results, oh, and, okay. and there are two things you can say about it. One, there is a substantial increase that starts to begin about at the time of the publicity about Lee, 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 Ho, Lee Ho Win. Well, is that uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Win Ho Lee. Well, Win Ho Lee, well, sorry. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little worried about this. It also, I think one of the hopeful things is that there are a variety of states where this is not right. a problem. California, uh, New York. It yeah. turns out that the, that the states where this is a significant problem are states like Mississippi, Idaho. Uh, you, you can imagine, you know, those, those, that, that list. Yes, you are, uh, you're up. Um, hi, my name is Navlin Wong. I'm a, a freshman at the college and I'm also a Chinese citizen. And my question to you is, and you guys have brought it up, that in the next year there will be significant, I guess, change in the leadership of the party um, in China when Jiang Zemin steps down. And since this is an event that doesn't occur as frequently as it does in the United States, you know, every four years, every eight years, um, I was wondering, do you think that this would have um, some implications on the relations, especially when when um, when Zhu Rongji came to uh, brought up to be the premier of the party, there has been like significant changes, not just in Chin Chinese domestic politics, but with I guess economic cooperation with the United States. So, do you think the next transition of power would accomplish anything else? Tony Sage. 
Um, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be as dramatic a shift with this change of leadership as there was with the last. I mean, I think if you look at the next group of leaders coming up that many people have pinned faith on that maybe this is sort of, you know, technocrat slash democratic group that might uh, institute uh, more fundamental political change in China, that might be more in tune with an international environment. I don't really see that. I mean, I think this is the most part of the most heavily embedded technocratic generation with Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao. I, I don't, in, and unlike, I mean, Zhu Rongji is such a particular person to have come out of the communist system, having been persecuted himself in the anti-rightist period, that it, it's made him a very particular character. I think most of the next set is a very bureaucratic set of leaders. So I can't see that they of themselves are going to launch and really think about reconfiguring the Chinese system economically or, or politically. I mean, I think they're reasonably competent people. That's a different set of issues. However, the environment they're going to come into leadership under might push them to have to confront issues more quickly than they've thought about. I mean, WTO is supposedly about trade issues, but it, it, even though it doesn't appear in the documents, it presumes a certain type of political structures and functioning around law, uh, openness of views, exchange of ideas, and so forth, and accountability, that China will have to amend its political institutions and legal institutions quite significantly to meet those WTO demands. Now, there's the other pressures that Merle is talking about within society. And it seems to me that there are structural questions uh, at work here, not just the long term, you know, if we have a middle class, will we have democracy? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe it takes 50 years, maybe it takes 40 years, we're not really quite yeah. sure, because different countries show us different things. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a very different economy. And as Yasheng talks about, China is extraordinarily open economically. And with WTO will be one of the most open developing countries ever in the history of the world. That will have profound consequences through the political system. If you want high growth in the modern world, you have to have high flows of information. You have to organize your society in a different way which moves much more horizontally than the kind of vertical traditional Leninist silo patterns. You have to allow more flexibility. You have to allow more openness. And these are, these are kind of structural pressures that if China wants to meet its objectives of retaining high level economic growth, which it has to do to meet a whole range of objectives, not only for its own people, but its own legitimacy objectives to rule, it will push it, I think, over the next five years to countenance questions of fundamental political restructuring that they haven't even thought about. Now, I don't think that necessarily means we're talking about you know, multi-party uh, electoral system. I think that's a red herring. That, that's not what it's about. I mean, democracy has to have a function. It has to provide benefits. But I think the pressures are going to increase and increase. Or, you know, are you just going to shoot farmers in Jiangxi because they protest? You have to think of ways that provide channels, institutional channels, to stop that kind of protest becoming increasingly anti-systemic. And that, that does require structural accommodation. Let's, let's take two more questions. Yes. Hi, my name is Kara Scherer, and I'm a graduate student here at Harvard and also a former uh, officer at the US Embassy in Beijing. Yeah. That's very recognized. Yes, you I, do. I, sorry. <laughs> I used to work your visits all that's the time. Right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but, and that's actually where I want to speak to you and make a couple comments about okay. government and media. I want to talk to you from please, the... Please make us ask a yes, question. Yes, it'll be fast. It's very, uh, just from a very, very low level. Let's get out of the academy. Let's get out of the statements from on high, from George Bush and from Jiang Zemin, and go down to the people who are at the very bottom 
uh, who are calling the Chinese Ministry of Defense every day, who are there working those relationships. And, you know, I, I, a lot of people have generated laughter criticizing the, the government uh, on both sides and the media. But the fact is, is that there are a lot of hardworking people who are rational and who know each other, who like each other, who go out um, and have tea with each other, who, who, you know, people who don't want to see a war, people who don't want to see um, hotheads, people who don't read the New York Times and think, oh, this is what the United States says, and people who don't read Remy Mirabal and say, oh, well, this is how every Chinese, you know, feels. I just, one question, or one, one thing about the media is, I was in Beijing during the Belgrade um, bombing incident, and I just, I was confined to quarters for seven days, so I got a chance to watch CNN and, um, and Joyan uh, Dan uh, Shatai and Wei Shi Dan Shatai and all that. And I just want to say about, um, you know, China's, Chinese media not having freedom. Well, I think they have as little freedom as our media does. Our media is controlled by ratings and editors, and the Chinese media is also controlled by editors, you know, whoever you want to call that, propaganda bureau, whatever. But the fact is, it's the same thing. Well, I have to say, in the, in the tradition of, of what was said by Mr. Wong, that I challenge that, and it's bullshit. And to compare that the free press in this country with the press in China is nonsense, in my opinion. Yes. My name is Cliff Davidson. I'm a junior at the college, and I have another media question. Um, I'd like to get your responses to Bush's um, direct response to the, uh, the letter written by the wife of the pilot, or supposedly written by the wife of the pilot. Who wants to take that? Could you repeat the question? Yep. I, the response, uh, was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in whether you think it was appropriate for Bush to respond directly to the wife of the pilot who was saying yeah. that, uh, oh, that, yeah. that that he, you know, he was murdered. I just have a short answer. It's really the meaningless because all the sorrows or apologies were retracted. He said, you know, you know, essentially. So, I mean, this guy was painted as a hot dog. He killed himself and almost uh, killed uh, all the 24 crew members. So basically, I think all this, you know. Uh, it's, it's, Really, the letter itself is meaningless. That's all we have time for. I'm sorry to say we've run out of, in fact, we've run over. I want to, sorry to thank yes. everybody. Kurt Campbell, Yang Deng, Merle Goldman, Ethan Guang, Tony Taylor. Thank you very much. Hi. <laughs>